I was a little concerned by the way that this talk was billed. The Archdeacon of Stansted told people in Colchester that they should come and see the Bishop of Colchester on fire. It reminded me of a time when, along with the Bishop of Worcester, I was asked to speak on Ezekiel 37. The posters read, uh, Worcester Anglican Renewal Movement, the Right Reverend John Inge and the Venerable Roger Morris. And then underneath it said, can these dry bones live? Anyway, this is me on fire. Billy Joel is right. We didn't start the fire. It was always burning since the world's been turning. But at some point in human history, our plucky ancestors learned to control it, maybe throwing some dung on a naturally occurring fire in order to prolong it or taking glowing embers from one fire and using them to ignite another. You see, fire requires three ingredients. Fuel, and mostly that would have come from plants. Oxygen, which makes up around 20% of the air around us. And a source of ignition, a spark from a flint, or heat from the friction of rubbing two pieces of wood together. That as King Louis would say, is the power of man's red flower. That is the secret behind what is perhaps our greatest invention. Charles Darwin identified fire and language as the two key things that mark us out as humans. And it may well be that our language developed as we gathered around the fireside, the hearth, rejoicing in the fact that what had been our daily diet of raw meat salad had given way to something much more exciting. And so maybe the larger brains that we have, fed by more digestible nutrients, and our smaller jaws and daintier teeth, have all evolved alongside and because of the way that our ancestors gathered around the hearth, eating home-cooked food. Which all comes down to one thing. Fire. Now all that may seem a bit prehistoric and crude, but it is still fire that shapes our lives today. Last year, 51.5% of our electricity came from burning stuff mostly gas, but also biomass and coal. And the internal combustion engine, essentially a very well-controlled fire, has given us the means to travel further in one day than our ancestors did in a lifetime. And fire has even put people on the moon. It's not just smoke that doesn't exist without fire. We probably would not exist without fire of one sort or another. But as you will be all too aware, our addiction to combustion means that we're literally and metaphorically playing with fire. And it looks as though we are all about to get our fingers badly burnt. Metaphors aside, it's getting hot in here and out there and pretty much everywhere. Really hot. In 2018, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, published a report looking at what the impact would be of a global temperature rise of 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. And the report warned of increasingly extreme weather events of sea levels rising, of species becoming extinct, of glaciers melting, of human health deteriorating, of food becoming scarce, of clean water supplies running dry, of tensions rising between peoples, of the rise of migration as people flee on hospitable parts of the earth, and of the risk to economic growth. But the report soberingly notes that as things stand, 
a global temperature rise of 1.5 degrees centigrade is actually a best case scenario. At present, we're about 1 degree centigrade above pre-industrial levels, but we're on course for a rise of around 3 degrees centigrade, which would be unimaginably catastrophic. Ruth Valerio in the Lent book says the report gives us 10 years to alter course and says that the speed at which we do or do not cut our emissions between now and 2030 will make or break our prospects of keeping temperature rise to one and a half degrees centigrade. She says the world is way off track from reaching net zero even as late as 2050 and it is increasingly clear that even that goal is too late for millions of people. If we do not reduce our emissions, our carbon emissions, by 45% in the next 10 years, it is likely we will see 100 million people being pushed back into poverty. Global crop yield losses of as much as 5% over the next 10 years and the disappearance of all of our coral reefs. Now let's just revisit the science, and please bear with me if all this is a bit old hat. Here we are on planet Earth. Our main source of energy is the sun. During the day, the Earth absorbs energy from the sun. And during the night, as well as during the day, some of that energy is reflected back out into space. Now we know how much energy comes to the Earth from the sun. And that energy, that sunlight, comes to us in a variety of wavelengths ultraviolet, visible and infrared. And that light has to pass through layer upon layer of our atmosphere. And some of those layers in our atmosphere absorb some of the light, while others allow the light to pass right through. And some layers in our atmosphere reflect some of that light back out into space. All told, and again all this we know, all told, just over three quarters of the energy from the sun actually makes it down to the Earth's surface when the sun is directly overhead. Now, depending on what the surface is like, whether it's water or sand or whatever, some of that energy is then absorbed by the Earth, and some of it is reflected. And what we know is that just under one third, on average, of the incident radiation from the Sun gets reflected off the surface of the Earth, and just above two thirds, 69%, gets absorbed by the Earth. So when we put all the factors that we know together, the Sun's power output, the size of the Earth, the distance from the Sun to the Earth, the amount of sunlight that the Earth absorbs versus the amount that it reflects, we can calculate what the average temperature of the Earth should be. And the answer that we get is that on average the Earth is minus 18 degrees centigrade, about the same temperature as the inside of your freezer at home. Now, that's absurd. We know that's not how it is, thankfully, because minus 18 degrees centigrade is a little bit chilly. Instead, our planet has an average temperature of around plus 15 degrees centigrade, much more civilised. So what's going on? Why are our calculations wrong? Well, the Earth is effectively wrapped in an insulating blanket that stops some of the heat that the Earth radiates from escaping. 
Just as the atmosphere did not let all of the sunlight through to the Earth, so the atmosphere also traps some of the infrared warming light that the warmed Earth radiates. Now, because of its particular wavelength, there are certain chemicals, certain substances, that absorb this infrared radiation. And they are mainly water vapour, carbon dioxide and methane. And it is these three gases in our atmosphere, along with smaller amounts of ozone, nitrous oxide and so on, that act as a blanket trapping the energy that the warmed earth is radiating just as a blanket or a duvet or a sleeping bag stops the heat that's escaping from your body from leaving the area around your body and therefore helps you to stay warm. And the thicker the blanket, the warmer you will be. And you, you will know that you wouldn't use a 13 or 15 tog duvet in the summer because that would trap in too much warmth and you'll overheat. Well, in just the same way, uh, you not so much with the water vapour, the amount of which has uh, remained fairly constant, but as we have added to the amount of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere, so that insulating blanket around the Earth has got thicker and thicker, and we have got warmer and warmer. We talk about carbon neutrality and zero carbon. But really the killer, and I really do mean the killer, is carbon dioxide. When you burn stuff in a fire like wood or oil or coal, the stuff combines with oxygen. Now, leaving aside the ash, which is made up of things like calcium carbonate, phosphate, salts of potassium, and so on, the two products, as well as heat, that you end up with in a fire are carbon dioxide and water. And as we keep belching out more and more and more carbon dioxide, so it adds to the levels that we already have and thickens still further the insulating blanket that wraps around the earth. And that is why it's getting hot in here. Now, just as an aside, what do you do when the temperature rises? Well, what many people are doing is that they buy an air conditioner. But these are almost uniquely power-hungry appliances. A small air conditioning unit cooling an average size room uses more energy than running four fridges. While cooling an average house using air conditioning is the equivalent of running more than 15 fridges. During the 2018 heat wave in Beijing, 50% of the power capacity was being used for air conditioning. There are just over 1 billion single room air conditioning units in the world right now, about one for every seven people on Earth. But reports suggest that by 2050, there could be as many as 4.5 billion air conditioning units, meaning they will be as common as mobile phones are today. The United States already uses as much electricity for air conditioning each year as the United Kingdom uses in total. The International Energy Agency predicts that the rest of the world will reach similar levels and air conditioning will use about 13% of electricity worldwide, producing about 2 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. So we're generating electricity by burning coal and gas and biomass in order to stay cool because the temperature's rising due to the gas and the coal and the biomass that we're burning. Do you get the sense that this could be a vicious circle? Now, I just mentioned that in passing. Let's get back to fire. 
I've said that it is one of our most important inventions. In fact, I think it defines us. You see, fire consumes. We talk, don't we, about being consumed by fire. And as we have harnessed and developed the power of fire, so we have grown used to things being consumed. We use things up. We wear things out. And maybe we get to thinking that there's nothing left in this old world that we even need to care about. Fire has effectively turned every single one of us into consumers. We believe that it is our right to consume and nothing should get in the way of our consumer rights. And so I want to spend the rest of the time that I have now saying something about consumption because it is our classification of ourselves as consumers that's killing the planet. In Leviticus chapter 19, we're given this instruction. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Now that teaching makes sense in an agricultural setting and when the practice of gleaning was common spread. Now that practice is enjoying something of a resurgence through the work of Feedback's Gleaning Network, which works with farmers, volunteers and charities to rescue hundreds of tonnes of fruit and vegetables that would otherwise be wasted. But we're not all farmers. And so that instruction may seem an odd place to start, except I believe that the principle remains. Don't hoard and keep and consume everything for yourself. Don't become so obsessed with the bottom line. Leave some space on the edges of all you earn and own so that you might care for the poor. Share something of what you have with those in need. Make sure you have a plan in place to provide for the poor, because it's not all about you. Now, I think that this passage is part of God's redefinition of Israel. It is the time-honoured approach of saying, that this may be how things operate in the rest of the world, but let it not be so among you. You are to be different, to live by different values, to not live as the world lives. And so God says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare, or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. And I think God is saying, you are not to be a consumer. You do not have a divine right to use things up. You are to be more frugal thoughtful, moderate, humble and easygoing. So what does that look like? Obviously it means not emptying supermarket shelves, uh, one hand sanitizer, one pack of loo roll, is probably quite enough. Maybe it means turning down the heating, avoiding using air conditioning and just dressing more appropriately. As the fell walker Alfred Wainwright said, there's no such thing as bad weather, only unsuitable clothing. And talking about clothing, maybe this is about making do and mending, darning socks, patching jeans, 
resoling and rehealing our shoes and boots. The National Household Waste Composition Study, published by the charity RAP, found 336,000 tonnes of clothing in the household residual waste in 2017. They said that despite British people becoming more environmentally aware, we are buying and throwing away clothing at a faster rate each year. And the report says that one of the reasons for this is the reduced lifespan of our clothes, meaning they must be disposed of sooner. Consumption of clothing has increased over the last decade as the cheap fast fashion trend took hold. So if you go to the website loveyourclothes.org.uk, then the first thing they say is to choose clothes that are better made and that are easy to care for. Or maybe to hire or swap clothes or buy pre-loved clothes from a charity shop or a vintage store. Earlier this month, it was reported that some footballers and their wives and girlfriends, or wags as they're called, like Jamie and Rebecca Vardy, Luke and Vanya Modric, Cesc and Daniela Fabregas, and Cesar and Adriana Espilicueta, were going to war on clothes waste by holding a huge online auction of their unwanted goods for charity. The auction is the brainchild of ex-Chelsea goalkeeper Carlo Cudicini's partner, Agnoska Giannotti. She said that she hopes to make wearing second-hand clothes trendy and to reduce the 10% of global carbon emissions caused by the fashion industry. Of course, the same goes for furniture. You don't have to go to large Swedish warehouses to buy brand new chipboard creations. You can go to eBay or an auction and buy excellent solid wood furniture at rock bottom prices. Let's make second hand everything trendy. Reduce. Reuse. Recycle. Don't just consume. You do not have a divine right to use things up. You are to be more frugal, thoughtful, moderate, humble and easygoing. Greta Thunberg said, Adults keep saying we owe it to the young people to give them hope. But she said, I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel a fear I feel every day. And then I want you to act. I want you to act as if you would in a crisis. And she added, I want you to act as if the house was on fire. Because it is. Friends, we are literally burning to death. We have to do something. Pope Francis published this prayer in his encyclical Laudato Si. All-powerful God. You are present in the midst of the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love, that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace, that we may live as brothers and sisters harming no one. O God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives, that we may protect the world and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who would look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognise that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love and peace. Amen.